Previously, we took a look at sound pressure. Sound pressure is a field quantity and it changes based on the distance from the source and can be easily measured using a microphone or some other pressure sensitive transducer. In this video, we'll talk all about sound power and on all three points, sound power is completely different. It is a power or energy quantity and not a field quantity. There's no concept of distance when talking about sound power. It is independent of directionality and is independent of distance from the source or the observer. It is a constant value no matter what the environmental conditions are. And sound power is a theoretically calculated value, which can't easily be measured by a single device. So based on all these starting points, you might think that there are totally unrelated concepts. But there is a cause and effect relationship between them. We previously looked at a heater analogy, but this time let's look at light. A light bulb is rated to some electrical power. An LED light, rated to a power of 10 watts, produces some amount of light. It doesn't matter whether the 10 watt LED light is a, in a small room, or a large room, or in a closed box. The 10 watt rating will remain the same, wherever the bulb may be. The intensity of light emitted might be different at different distances from the source, but the source itself remains unchanged. It continues to emit light at a constant rate. The 10 watt that represents the power rating on the bulb is a calculated value, and it's easy to see the advantages of such a rating. With it, you could make an apples to apples comparison. Given the design and manufacturing process is the same, you can clearly compare three different LED lights rated at 1 watt, 10 watt, and 100 watt. Based on this alone, you can make decisions about where to use them, what kind of space requires what rating of light. You don't need to measure the intensity of light produced at different spatial locations, you could just calculate that value just by knowing the power rating on the space you are in. So as you can imagine, the sound power or acoustic power is quite an important measure in the field of acoustics. Since sound power is a constant, non-directional value, it's possible to compare the sound output of different devices without any knowledge of the environment in which they were tested or the distance at which measurements were taken. This makes sound power levels ideal for product labeling, for comparing the sound emission of different power tools, for example. If an operator were to use a pneumatic drill, for instance, if he knows the sound power generated from this tool, he would know the appropriate level of ear protection to use and the maximum time that he can spend on the equipment in one go to meet health and safety guidelines and to prevent long-term hearing damage. You could theoretically compute the sound pressure level at any distance from the source just by knowing the sound power of the source. So an acoustic consultant could then determine if the resulting noise emissions from the construction site would adversely affect a nearby residence and will comply with relevant regulations or if mitigation measures should be designed or different quieter machinery should be used. All that is well and good. But for audio engineers and producers, sound power is not a particularly useful metric to know. Power ratings are also applied to loudspeakers and monitors, but that's electrical power, not sound power. And we'll get to that at some point in time. But I choose to go further with this topic because this is the first time we're actually dealing with representing and quantifying a power quantity. So far, we've only looked at sound pressure, which is a field quantity. So let's dig a little deeper. Acoustic sound power is the total airborne acoustic energy emitted by a device over unit time. It's measured in watts. Acoustic parallels of many devices are quite small. For example, a noisy coffee grinder may only emit about 5 milliwatts of acoustic power. On the other hand, a rocket at takeoff could produce 100 million watts of sound power. The range of values that sound power can take on is massive. So naturally, we want to represent these values in a logarithmic scale. Or better yet, a decibel scale. A bell is said to be the log of the ratio between two power quantities perfectly suited for our needs. And a decibel is just one-tenth of a bell. And since the decibel is a relative scale of values, 
we need to pick the reference power level against which all other power levels are measured. What do we pick for the reference value then? But before that, we want the power level in decibels to be comparable to pressure level in decibels. Since they are both dimensionless units, we want some means of comparing between the two. We don't want to have these values completely different from each other. To achieve this, we need to have similar conditions when choosing the reference value. When choosing the reference value for sound pressure, we chose the minimum pressure value that a good pair of ears could just about hear a 1 kHz sine tone in an anechoic chamber. This value was established to be around 20 micropascal. Now the question is, what is the power required to generate this pressure value from the same measuring distance? The complicated answer to this question is 10 to the power of minus 12 watts, or 1 picowatt, which is a tiny infinitesimal value. But that's the value we need to plug in as the reference. So there you go. The formula for sound power level in decibels, or SWL. But wait, if you've watched the previous video, we derived the sound pressure level, or SPL, and it had this formula. Why is one value multiplied by 10 and the other by 20? It's a bit confusing, isn't it? In fact, if you look at a lot of other decibel units, they're all similar, but they have the same quirk. What do you use? 10 or 20? How do you even keep track of all of them? The simple answer is you have to identify whether the unit you're looking at is a power quantity or a field quantity. Power quantities always have a multiplier of 10 and field quantities always have a multiplier of 20. That's because in the real world, power quantities are directly proportional to the square of the field quantities. So sound power is directly proportional to the square of the pressure. And electrical power is directly proportional to the square of the voltage or the square of the current. And the log of the squared quantity is just two times the log of the quantity. Make sense? So previously, I mentioned that by knowing the sound power of a source, you can theoretically calculate the sound pressure caused by it at a distance. I say theoretically because the formula assumes an ideal space, where the source is suspended in midair with no primary or secondary reflections of any kind. In the real world, these sort of spaces are hard to come by, but engineers make clever modifications to the formula to fit the space being measured. We'll, we'll not get into that. But we know that sound power is directly proportional to the square of the sound pressure. Let's bring back a couple of constant terms that were ignored. Here, r is the distance from the source, and 4 pi r square is actually the area of a sphere. We'll see how this is important when we talk about sound intensity. And q is called the directivity factor and is just one when we consider a spherical free field for sound propagation. And here's the amended formula for sound pressure level in decibels. Just by looking at it, it sort of makes sense. Sound pressure level is equal to the sound power level minus some value. As the distance from the source increases, the larger this term gets and the smaller the sound pressure level is. But when you move closer to the source, the pressure level increases, until you're right up against the source, where the sound pressure level is the exact same as the sound power level. This is a unique condition. The distance you need to be from the source to have the sound power level equal to the sound pressure level is 0.282 for a directivity of 1. Okay. So I'm not entirely sure how useful this information is for a lot of people out there. But it is interesting for sure. And a solid fundamentals backing goes a long way. So I'll talk about a few more of these theoretical topics before we get into the meat and bones of audio level measurements in computers, which you're probably more interested in. Coming up next is sound intensity.